Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are back at it another day that uh, unfortunately I am not able to be with you, but you're in good hands, and hopefully this information um, gets to you and makes sense to you by the time it's all said and done, and I hope you enjoy it. Today's uh, topic is going to be covering uh, what takes place after the, f the Battle of Gettysburg. So for your off the tee, let's reflect on why did Gettysburg mark the turning point for the war in your opinion. Go ahead and answer that question. Well, hopefully your answer um, had something to do with the fact that it was the high water mark of the South and that Gettysburg marked Lee's first defeat. And uh, by the time um, news had traveled that Lee had lost um, and the Gettysburg Address was made and that they had finally created the National Cemetery, um, the rest of the country had heard about the events of Grant in the West at Vicksburg. Um, and those two major victories really allowed for the Anaconda Plan to, to take full effect. So anyway, remember that Meade did not follow Lee after defeating um, him at Gettysburg. And uh, shortly thereafter, Lincoln fires Meade. Um, pretty typical. And so who did he put in charge? Well, the guy that had success in the West, Grant. And Grant had a plan. Um, obviously, Ulysses S. Grant was a pretty, pretty smart guy. But uh, again, he remember, he wasn't very popular because he did put thousands and thousands of men's lives on the line. Um, pretty much he was kind of an all-cost kind of guy. Anyway, um, he was given command of the Union Army uh, in March of 1864 after Lincoln fired Meade. And he pretty much had a belief that if I just pursue Lee until he's done um, and gives up, then the war will eventually come to an end. So his goal became to track down the Gray Fox, to go after Robert E. Lee at all costs. And so Grant moved his operations and his, his main generals that were under him to the East Coast, um, to Virginia, to pursue Lee at all costs. In the midst of that, he had a second part of his plan, which was to send William Tecumseh Sherman, and his job was to push through the, the deep south and destroy everything in his path. And uh, his story, we're going to find out about in a little, here in a little bit, um, is known as Sherman's March to the Sea. And what's funny about Sherman, little side note, is that Sherman was viewed as a psycho. Um, for the most part, when it came to the start of the war, because he talked about his plan or what he thought should be done well before it was needed. See, Sherman was viewed as kind of a crazy guy because he believed in exactly what they asked him to do at the end of the war. He believed in that at the start of the war. And they said, no, no, that's your ruthless, that's brutal, we, that's not the kind of tactics we're going to use. But by the time the war got to its end, I mean, four years into it, the desperation had happened and people wanted an end to the war pretty much at all costs. And so Sherman's plan made total sense. Um, and they, the, you know, he went from being demoted to being promoted um, by the war's end. And so basically the, the process of what you are about to, to see is going to be um, exactly what I just mentioned. Grant chasing Lee all the way down um, out of, you know, outside of Washington, D.C., and the 1864 to 1865, you're going to see a steady pattern of, of him following. Um, Lee here retreats um, and meets up at the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, then they fight another battle, the Battle of Spotsylvania. And no matter what happened, even if the Confederates won, which most of the time they did, uh, Grant never quit. And he just kept on coming. And then at Cold Harbor, he would fight some more. They would fight. And again, one thing led to another. And next thing you know, um, battle after battle, Lee finally was starting to get his army was getting, you know, to be dwindled down. Um, and it didn't matter. Win or lose for Grant, he just kept pursuing him. And they followed a path, you know, as far as they could go until eventually at Appomattox he would surrender. Now, here's Richmond right here. That's the capital city where um, the president of the Confederacy is hanging out at. And, uh, you know, these battles outside of the, the, you know, just a short distance from 
uh, Richmond um, are really making Jefferson Davis nervous. So, I mean, every battle that's fought is really just designed to get closer and closer to Richmond. Well, at the Battle of Petersburg is going to be a defining moment. We'll take a look at that here in a little bit. But Grant, he his Virginia campaign was ruthless. Uh, like I said, his goal was to inflict more losses on the Confederates than they could withstand. He brought as many men as he could to each battle, and again, the Confederates threw as many men as they had, and it didn't matter if, if Grant lost more men by the time the battle was over, as long as the Confederates withdrew and keep kept heading south uh, towards Richmond, he was finding himself successful. And that's what... That's what Lincoln loved about him. He was an all-go, no-quit kind of guy. And Grant would end up losing about 17,000 men at his first battle of the wilderness. Uh, then at Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor, he'd lose another 7,000. I mean, it never ended until eventually Grant arrived outside of Richmond at a place called Petersburg. And this is where the war changed. The war changed into a whole different style of fighting. And you're going to be reading about this um, here in a little bit and seeing a couple of little examples that I'll, I'll throw up. But this was a different style of warfare. And it would become a siege. And it would become using new technology and then also new tactics. Because the blood and, and death that they have faced um, in the process of this war for the last four years has just been horrible. So they decide new strategies are needed and they start defining those strategies through what we call trench warfare and that will become the tactic that will be used at the end of this war and into the modern wars of uh, World War One. and in the meantime like I said Grant was very successful out here in the west at Vicksburg and eventually he starts working his way and progressing this direction and it would be at Chattanooga that he would gain even more fame and at that point is he was ready to come and replace uh, up way up here Meade um, just in the in the eastern theater of the war but I showed you this map because it talks about and it shows you Farragut down here again um, remember he took New Orleans and now he takes um, Mobile Alabama and uh, he also sends up uh, a foot soldier Bragg and Bragg will eventually join up with William Tecumseh Sherman um, and they will have their own issues and, and try to duke it out. Um, see Bragg left Mobile after Farragut took it over and then eventually like I said fighting against uh, Grant and I mean there's whatever can be done is trying to be done by the South and it's not pretty much to no avail. Well at Atlanta Sherman would would decimate these whatever's left of the Confederate forces and eventually make this heavy march to the sea and it would be under that march to the sea where he would gain his fame and he would implore his style of warfare um, this is a better look at it just to show you from Atlanta to Savannah the the path of destruction that he went on well, this was called total war and Sherman's march to the sea was exactly that. It was total war. And total war is war against the military. It's war against the people. It's designed to destroy the way of life in the South. And it really defined everything. Lincoln used Sherman's success in the total war aspect of, of you know, marching to the sea uh, to allow his reelection to take place. And so he gained a lot of popularity. And this was 300 mile path of destruction. And it was just awesome, awesome fighting. And really, there's no opposition. That's the, the key thing about this. Is it's, it's a fight against the people. And a fight against the land. Um, they're, they're really fa they didn't face any opposition. Notice you don't see any red lines on there of any battles or anything. This was a attack on the way of life of the South to destroy their spirit and that's exactly what Sherman did um, you're gonna see an example here of a second of what they called Sherman's neckties and he destroyed every piece of infrastructure that the South could use to fight the war against the Union and so we're gonna take a look at this story the hymn to America and it's the hymn to the possibilities and the great sacrifices of this country 
But in 1864, the war remains deadlocked. With an election looming and a challenge coming from those who want to negotiate a peace with the South, Lincoln knows he needs to land a decisive blow. At some point, somebody gets tired, somebody blinks, somebody makes a mistake. And when you're talking about war, that mistake, that's everything. Lincoln puts the North's entire industrial might behind one final push. The man who will lead the charge from Chattanooga to Atlanta, William Sherman. His orders, to stop for nothing. I would make this war as severe as possible and show no symptoms of tiring till the South begs for mercy. Advancing under the cover of night, Sherman's march is sustained by one of the greatest logistical operations yet seen in this conflict. Sherman knows he needs to throw everything he's got at the Confederate Army. While he uses his own supply lines to maximum effect, he destroys those of the South ripping up their railroad and bending it beyond use. In one day, the North supply lines replaced 200,000 bullets. While the South is left scavenging on the battlefield for spent rounds, food, even old boots. Sherman calls it total war, a scorched earth approach that becomes the trademark of modern warfare. Finally, with Atlanta under siege, Confederate forces set fire to their own munition stores before abandoning their city to the Union soldiers. Sherman's tactics of total war have won out. His victory helped secure Lincoln's election in the fall. With Atlanta in ruins, he just keeps going, now launching what will be his final assault, the march to the sea. In the 19th century equivalent of shock and awe, 62,000 Union soldiers wreak a 60-mile-wide path of destruction across Georgia from Atlanta to the coast at Savannah. Supply lines are cut. Villages are sacked and crops torched. Anything of military value is destroyed. Within six months, General Lee has tendered the Confederate Army's surrender. The rebellion is over. The South will have to submit to the Union and bring an end to slavery. By the act of... So you got a good uh, chance to see a little bit about Sherman's March to the Sea, and uh, those neckties are pretty cool. Um, but the next phase in this process is the fall of Richmond. That was the key. So while Sherman is having success marching from 
now, uh, you know, from Atlanta to Savannah, and now Savannah working his way even north, all the way through North Carolina and South Carolina, trying to get to Virginia. Um, the fall of Richmond is, is going to be key. And the style of warfare that takes place is going to be, like I said, a very different one. And the Battle of Petersburg is going to be a siege. It's going to take about 10 months for them to stand off in the new style of warfare as trench warfare and trench battle took place. Um, Lee, Lee ran out of men. He ran out of resources. I mean, over a 10-month time period, and they just t told you about the impact of all the the you know technology and, and all the communication and the supply lines and how the North were was using that against uh, Lee. I mean that was that was the key to this whole thing. Um, that's where things really got got turned around, and Lee just couldn't hold out. He ran out of supplies and resources and, and just had to ultimately give up. And eventually um, he would be driven away from the city and that would lead to um, the Union being able to take over Richmond. Um, and it had everything to do with the style of warfare that was going on. And uh, I wanted to give you guys a chance to take a little bit of a look at this. Um, this is from a film called Cold Mountain. Same as us. Same too much war. Hey, yep. Don't worry, son. Them Yankee boys keep store hours. They ain't open yet. Come from. Hey, that's French breakfast. He's mine, folks. Hey, I can't. So that last part that you just saw there was the process of the Union Army digging tunnels and then bombing underneath the trenches of the Confederates. Um, unfortunately, what they didn't anticipate was what was going to happen next. And so this kind of gives you a sense of uh, how they made a mistake with their, um, their engineering. to see one of the more famous events that happened at the Battle of Petersburg. Uh, the Union Army 
ran right into their own massive grave crater that they created from their underground explosives to try to they thought they would just destroy where the where the confederates were at but they just blew a big old hole that they couldn't climb out of and um it got pretty ugly and and uh the death toll that took place there was was really horrible um but in the end um uh, grant uh was able to overcome Lee and uh, drive him out of Petersburg and eventually Lee would end up retreating to a place um, called Appomattox Courthouse where on uh, April 9th 1865 um, they would meet and discuss the terms of a surrender and you're going to be reading about some of that today um, and we'll focus on that next time um, when I when I get a chance to teach you kind of the end of the war um, and wrap things up um, but it was it was pretty generous and, and in re, in the end they would they would realize that when the war came to an end uh, we're family again we're we're back to where we were before which is being part of the United States and trying to, to maintain a country together so we'll talk more about this um, as they as it comes up um, next time when I'm teaching um, but uh, all that Grant asked was that they turn over their arms they were allowed to keep their belongings go back to their farms and he took care of them. Um, they were now our countrymen again. And so that was the most unique thing about this war, is it wasn't a war against a foreign en enemy, but rather uh, our own people. And so, which brings forth, um, you're in the hole today. What is the greatest challenge that will be faced after the war comes to an end? And hopefully, um, that will kind of make sense to you, that we, we do have some big challenges ahead of us.